we pray that you would join our time this morning. We pray that we would be blessed. And Father, we pray that we might learn something new. So I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. Amen. Because, Father, you're my strength and my only redeemer. Amen. Amen. My thoughts are taken back by a few years to a distant land in a faraway place when I sat in a chair in a small room. It was dimly lit. There was plastic flowers on a table next to me. And I remember that my chair had these big, ornate eaves type things that stuck out from the back to make it feel like I was confined and couldn't move from left to right. I was stuck. And as I sat there with a supervisor to my left, with a couple of other individuals to my right, and one particularly engaged gentleman right across from me, as he looked at me and he said, I have been president of companies, I have been directors of professional groups, I have been administrator of hospitals, and I have been involved with numerous churches in my lifetime, and never have I ever encountered a pastor so unskilled and incompetent as yourself. Oh. <laughs> I sat there listening to what he was saying, and I began to think to myself, I hate confrontation. This is awful. Oh, I felt like becoming a pile of liquid and just seeping through the cushions and going into the carpet and sliding down the hill and into the sewer and disappearing. It was awful. And that particular confrontation led to more confrontations led to a variety, a whole process of reconciliation and, and mediation and, and really a sense of, of, of new confrontation in my life as a leader. And I began to think, man, is it possible? Could I hopefully, maybe as a dream, might I hope that I could go the rest of my life and never experience this again? Please, Lord. But you know what? It doesn't work that way. As Christians, we are called to a place where we have to engage with people with different perspectives. And while at that moment, I didn't necessarily see where this man was coming from, and he, Lord knows, didn't see where I was coming from, we were completely different people with different perspectives. And as long as we serve on this earth with people, and as long as we serve with other people, people with different opinions and different perspectives, we will always be dealt with confrontation. We will always have to deal we will always have to deal with differences of opinion. And so the question is, as we as Christians, we've been taught to make things better. We've been taught to just, you know, make things go away and just pretend that everything's okay. How do we as Christians deal with confrontation? Well, as we've been studying through the book of Galatians, a book that deals a lot with what God's grace has meant for our lives, we suddenly come to this passage where Paul takes a break and gives us an example of confrontation. And that's why our sermon title today is Confronting Holy People. How do we as a church confront those around us that are also Christians, but yet we see completely different points of view? We see completely at odds on a particular issue. So turn with me to Galatians chapter 2. As we spend a couple of short moments this morning learning some lessons about confrontation in our lives. Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2, and we'll begin with verse 11. Galatians chapter 2, and we'll begin with verse 11. Now, Paul. As I mentioned to you in the last previous sermons, he's been writing to the church of Galatia because he feels that there have been some heresies. There has been some problems there. And so he wants to make sure that they know that things need to change. 
things need to be different. So he sets the stage for chapter 1, talking about how things are and how things, where he comes from and what his background is, what the context for his life is. But then, all of a sudden, we get to chapter 2 and verse 11, and he drops this bomb. Listen closely. Now, when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face, because he was to be blamed. Now, does that sound like confrontation to you? Some versions say he rebuked him to his face. Other versions say he called him out. He stood him down. He looked at him face to face. And it says, the Bible says that he withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed, because he was wrong, because he was in error. Man, just that verse alone should put us a little bit on edge as we think to ourselves, man, do I have what it takes to engage in any sort of process like that with anybody that I know? Before that, we should ask the question, should I engage in a process like that with anybody that I know? I mean, we're so much more accustomed to saying, get along, we should treat other people the way that we would want them to treat us. Right? I mean, we, that's the kind of the normal way that we understand things. But continuing on in the story, Paul begins to share out some very clear contextual components to the story. He says this, verse 12. For, this is the reason, this is the reason that I had to talk to him like this. This is the reason I had to call him out. It says, for, before certain came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself fearing those who were of the circumcision. You see, back in olden times, Peter had been this guy that would not eat with Gentiles. He was under the assumption that a good Christian, a new believer of Jesus, would not associate themselves with people that were of pagan origin. And so he said to himself, you know what? The Bible makes it pretty clear that we should be separate. So people that do not believe the same way that I do, I'm not going to spend any time with them. Gentiles that aren't Christians, I'm not going to spend any time with them. I'm not going to give them the time of day. I'm not going to do anything for them. Well then, Peter had a vision. Do you remember this vision? Peter had a vision where he, he's lying on top of a building and he falls asleep. And in that sleep, he sees in his night's eye, he sees in his night's eye this sheet being lowered down from the heavens. And Peter's kind of groggy and he's kind of, you know, he's kind of out of it. He's not really seeing a whole lot and, and he's not really understanding what's happening. But slowly the sheep gets lowered down from heaven and he looks on it and there's all sorts of craziness on it. There's snakes and there's all sorts of unclean animals and, and weird reptiles and all sorts of, of animals that he has been expressly told not to eat. And then he hears a voice, Peter, eat. He says, man, who's telling me to eat? Because this is obviously not something I should eat. But then he hears the voice again. Peter, eat. And he says, why should I be eating this? And, and then all of a sudden, the voice explains, it is no longer unclean. And a couple of verses later, he's given the, the meaning to this whole vision when he says, you should associate yourself with the Gentiles because they are no longer considered to be for and they're no longer considered to be unclean. And so Peter wakes up out of his vision and he realizes, man, the way that I was treating Gentiles, the way I was treating foreigners was all wrong. I should be treating them with love. The same grace that God treated me, I should treat them. The same acceptance that God gives to me, I should give them. The same invitation that God gives me to associate with Him, I should invite my Gentile neighbors to associate with. So Peter's perspective was totally changed. And so before, when he wouldn't associate with Gentiles, now all of a sudden he would associate with Gentiles and he would spend time with them. But the Bible says that things began to change. It says here in verse 12, See, before he would eat with the Gentiles, but when they came, these people from James, we don't have a whole lot more explanation, certain men from James, but after that they came, he withdrew and he separated himself. Fearing those who were of the circumcision. You see, this goes back to this fundamental issue. 
This fundamental issue that these people were trying to explain to others, saying, you know what, you must be circumcised to be a part of us, or if you're not, you're not a part of us. And you must be this way to be a part of us, or you, if you're not, you can't be a part of us. You must look this way in order to be a part of us, because if you don't, you can't be a part of us. And the same thing was beginning to happen this way. They said, you know what, if you're a Gentile, and if you're not of Jewish lineage, then you can't be a part of us. And they began to set up all these different criteria, and while this is a different kind of criteria than what they've had in the past, it's the same basic issue. The church leaders at that time felt, you're either like us, and you can hang out with us, or you're not like us, and you can't be with us. And we've talked about what kind of fundamental flaw that is in the church, and how we should be upright and aggressive about rooting that out anytime we see that kind of philosophy. And Paul does that in this story. And Paul engages something with Peter. As we see in the next couple of verses, Paul takes a stand and he does this. Verse 13, it says, Because the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with this hypocrisy. Paul writing, But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you... Being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles, and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a manner is not justified by works, but of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul takes a stand on what is truth, and he confronts somebody else, because they are deviating from truth. And it brings up this whole issue of confrontation. Now, we as adults, we don't like to confront somebody any more than young people do. We usually think that kids say things that we would never say because we have a filter or that we have common sense. But yet we don't confront each other on issues any more than anybody else does. You see, because there's an issue of confrontation that makes us uncomfortable because it says, you know what? We really just should let other people do what they need to do and, you know, let, let bygones be bygones and, and live and let live and, and, you know, peace and, you know, to your mother and God bless you and, uh, you know, whatever you're into, I'm cool with and, and however you want to be, that's fine with me and, you know, just live and let live. And that's the way we normally understand life and that's the way we normally engage with each other. But it's possible that God calls us to live differently. Within the faith community, it's possible that God wants something else from us because it not only does it do something for you and me, but it does something for the body of believers. And you see, Paul felt a responsibility in this story, not only to himself. Paul felt that Peter had betrayed him, but Paul felt a responsibility to the church. Do we ever need to confront because it's the best thing for the church. Do we, ever need, do we ever need to confront because it's the best thing for us? Do we ever need to confront because it's the best thing for the other person? So this morning I wanted to go over a couple of things in the scriptures to give us an outline on what it means to get into confrontation with holy people. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And we're going to look at a couple of verses this morning specifically dealing with confrontation. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And if you have your Bibles this morning and you're in Matthew chapter 5, let me hear you say amen. amen. <coughs> Matthew chapter 5, we'll begin in verse 22. Well, let's begin in verse 21. You have heard it said... To those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. Verse 23. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. Now, who is speaking in this passage? Who is speaking in this passage? Jesus. 
Now think of this story as, a, as, a, as how it applies to our lives. Jesus is speaking to these people. He says, you know what? When you come to me and you come to, to speak to my life or you come and you bring a sacrifice to the altar, Jesus tells them, if you know that somebody has a problem with you, stop what you're doing and make sure and go back and make it right. And you have to see very closely the language that Jesus uses, Jesus uses in this story. Because he doesn't just say, if you come to the altar, and you bring a sacrifice, and you have a problem with somebody else, stop. Go and make it right. No, Jesus takes it to the next level. He says, if you come to the altar, and you know that somebody else has a problem with you, stop. Go and make it right. And that is counterintuitive to the way that we normally do things. Because normally, we go through life and we say, you know what? If so-and-so has a problem with me, what do we say? That's their problem. If my wife has a problem with me, that's her problem. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> but it doesn't work that way anywhere else in life. If someone has a problem with you, it's the same way. It's your problem. Because it gets into your life and you think about it and it creates a confusion and it creates friction and it creates a problem in your soul. And God says, that thing is real. You need to fix that. So 2,000 years ago, Jesus was already speaking to a psychological quirk that each one of us has and he calls it out as wrong. We function on a daily basis by saying, you know what, if, it's, if they have a problem, it's their problem. It's not my problem. Jesus, no, it is your problem. And he calls us into this holy confrontation within the body of believers to make these relationships right. Continuing on, he says, leave your gift there or the, before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. How often do we come to church? How often do we kneel down beside our beds in the morning? How often do we lay open the scriptures to engage with God knowing full well that we have parts of our lives that are hard and crusty, rusty and cobweb, relationships that are acrid and, and, and dirty and, and awful that need to be repaired. God says, stop. Stop. You need to fix that relationship because the way that we deal with other people says something about our own relationship with God. And so he says, you need to stop right there. Verse 25, he says, Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him, lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, and the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. Wild words that Jesus takes and he puts it on his head. He says, you know, when other people have a problem with you, it's your responsibility to make it right. Now turn with me to another passage, Matthew chapter 18. A couple of chapters to the right here. Matthew chapter 18. And he begins in verse, verse 15. It says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one, one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And again, Jesus gives the same theme that if somebody sins against you, go to them, share with them what the problem is, and seek to find reconciliation. That kind of confrontation makes us uncomfortable. In fact, that whole method, that whole procedure, seems to be opposite of the way that we normally function. If someone does something to you, it's your responsibility to go and do something for them. But see, Jesus was trying to get us to understand something. That the responsibility of reconciliation always begins with those that are aware of the problem. The responsibility of reconciliation always begins with those that are aware of the problem. Therefore, if you and I are aware of the problem, then you and I have a responsibility to see that relationship restored to healthiness. But we don't see things that way. We see the other person, and we, we walk around seeing these other people and saying, you know what, they need to fix their lives up. They need to get their junk in order. They need to get their stuff together. They need to come back and apologize. They need to fix this. And yet God is calling us if we wait around to get everyone else to come to us and apologize, we're going to be waiting around in eternity. It's the 
same idea when he says, you know, eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. As it's been said before too long, the whole world will be blind. We can't wait for that to happen. Holy confrontation, what Paul is talking about is that when we're aware of a problem, and when we stand on truth, that it is our responsibility to go to somebody else and seek to repair that relationship. Again, the responsibility of reconciliation always begins with those that are aware of the problem. This morning, I want to share with you something that I have been uh, that I've been very deeply blessed with for the last several years. A couple of years ago, I was a part of a of a study group. That, uh, that began to study through what it means to confront people in a healthy way. And so we began to read this book called Fierce Conversations. Now, a couple friends of mine over here have some handouts. I want you guys to see if you can get a copy of this handout to everyone here in the church. So start handing this out, and we're going to go through this handout together. I'm going to need one as well. We're going to go through it together. Now... What this handout is, is a model for confrontation. Thank you, dear. A model for confrontation. Now, if you don't have one, raise your hands. I want to make sure that everyone gets one. We're going we're gonna to hand one out to every single person in this church as much as possible. I printed off 160, 170, something like that. So we might not have one for all of the kids. But it's called a confrontation model. Now this is a confrontation model that I've put together in order to bring our church to a place where we can have at least something that we can look at to confront each other in a way that honors God. Because I believe that bringing more confrontation, more interaction with each other is going to be a good thing and it's going to be a positive thing for the kingdom. So, does anyone still need one? We're getting there, we're getting there. So Paul figures out that there's a problem. Peter has begun to act in a way that is theologically problematic. He is in error. And so Paul says, I need to confront Peter. And Paul begins to have a very fierce conversation with Peter, the entirety of which is not listed in Scripture. But he wants to bring Peter back to a place that is redemptive. A place where Peter is back in the truth, where Peter is, has a relationship that's been broken that now has been set right. I want you to take this piece of paper home. I want you to tuck it in your Bible. I want you to put it in your dresser. I want you to put it anywhere where you can resource this. And you can look at this in the future and use this to repair relationships. I want to go through it with you really quickly. As I said, this is adapted from Susan Scott's books, Fierce Conversation. It's in my library. It should be in yours if you deal with teams or you deal with organizations. Number one, if someone has a problem with you, if you see something in their life that's a problem, if you see any situation that needs confronting, number one, pray about the issue and clarify to yourself why is it important. Obviously, sometimes we want to confront people. We spend a lot of heat confronting people when it's not a big deal, when it's not something important. It's not vital to the organization. It's not a core value of our lives. So first of all, pray. Decide why it's important. Number two, reflect on your motives. Why would you want to deal? Why would you get, want to get into this confrontation with others, this other person? Spend time praying for God to give you a supernatural love for the other person. You see, oftentimes we don't feel love to those other people that we need to, that we want to confront. We don't feel any sort of compassion towards them. We actually feel kind of like an animosity. We need God's love in our hearts. And so, second of all, pray for God to give you a supernatural love. Pray for a redemptive view, view of the person. Number three, I want to encourage you to write down a personal statement. A personal opening lines that you're going to use in this. So, write an opening statement and practice it out loud. Make it no more than 60 to 90 seconds. Something like... I have to begin by bringing something up that might be uncomfortable for both of us. My goal is to ultimately help us, or the organization, by bringing this issue up. Please let me share an opening statement that takes about a minute, and then you're more than welcome to respond. 
This is what the opening statement looks like. So, number four. First, name the issue. Describe the heart issue in one succinct sentence or two. You can say something like, I feel that you disrespect me in meetings, and it's a problem. One sentence. Describe what the issue is. Number five, select a specific example of the behavior or situation you want changed. A week ago, you said this about me that was completely disrespectful. You give an example of, of what you would see as an example of that behavior, an example of that problem. Number six, describe your emotions about this issue. And when you did that, it made me feel this way. And when you do that periodically, it makes me, these kind of feelings come up in me. And this is how I feel when that happens. Number seven, clarify what's at stake. This is where you verbalize what you found out in step number one. You say, you know what, this is why this is important to me. Because when you disrespect me like that in public, what it does is it demoralizes our team. And it makes people not trust my leadership. And therefore they don't believe in the goals that we're trying to accomplish because they don't see my leadership as important or trustworthy. It weakens our organization. You know, something like that where you put at, what is at stake, what is the main issue. Number eight, identify ways that you have contributed to the problem. This is where it's super important for you to bring humility to the conversation. Oftentimes we leave this step out of any sort of confrontation because we say, you know what, it's their problem, it's their issue. There's nothing of mine that contributed to this issue. But you see, oftentimes, the vast majority of times, we're sinful people. It takes two to tango. We bring something to the problem. So whatever it is you can do, think of something that has, has contributed to the problem. You say, you know what, Tom or Bob or whatever, oftentimes I haven't been as quick as I should be to hear your opinion in the meetings. And that's my fault. Oftentimes I haven't been as eager as I should be to find out your insight on a particular issue. And I haven't been as eager as I should be to find out where you stand on a particular matter. And that's my fault. Whatever it might be, we are encouraged to find something that we can express as humility, something that we can show as skin in the game, what we have done to contribute to the problem. And then number nine, indicate your wish to resolve the issue. And you say, you know, Tom, I don't want this to stand between us. While this is a problem, I don't want us to have a problem in between us anymore. I want us to move beyond this. I want us to fix this. And number 10, this is where you engage the conversation. So hopefully up until this point, you've been able to get across everything you wanted to say. There hasn't been a whole lot of conversation. And this is where the conversation happens. You inquire into your partner's views, the person that you're confronting. And you, say, you use a lot of paraphrasing. These are simple ideas that you learn in, in interpersonal communication classes, but it's so important when you're engaged in this hot button crazy moment you say I'd like to hear where you're at I'd like to hear what you think and they say something like well all the times that all the times that you chair a meeting I don't feel like you respect me and so you would paraphrase and you say am I hearing you correctly that when I'm chairing the meeting you don't feel like you're being respected that's exactly what I feel and people feel like they've been listened to when you can paraphrase what they're saying and say it back to them it acknowledges that you're listening actively rather than zoning out, thinking about what you're going to be doing as soon as you get done with this awful conversation. You're paraphrasing, you're actively listening. Make sure that they know that you fully understand and acknowledge their position and interest. You don't have to agree, but you acknowledge, you understand. True resolution will be directly related to your sincerity in this step. We must humbly acknowledge where this person is coming from. We must listen to where they're at. Next step. Then you talk about, well, what have we learned? Where are we now? Has anything been left unsaid that needs saying? What is needed for resolution? How can we move forward from here given our new understanding? Now that we understand each other, where we're at, now that we've put this thing on the table, and then number 12, make a new agreement and determine how you'll hold each other accountable for keeping it. Plan how you will avoid this situation in the future. Keep this. Put it in your Bible. This is something, this is a resource 
that you can go to in your life when you say, you know what, God has called me to have functioning, healthy relationships that support and that encourage. And when I have a, a relationship in my life that is broken, that is detrimental, that is hurting, we need to be actively seeking to repair and make those relationships healthy. Now I understand, we live in a sinful world, there's always going to be relationships that get to a place that they're beyond repair. The devil has broken things down that sometimes they're outside of anything that can be done and they're hurtful and they're abusive. And sometimes relationships that are abusive and hurtful just simply need to be severed. But I would, I would encourage you to look at relationships from a perspective that says, you know what? There are way more relationships that can be saved than should be lost. We have lost way too many relationships out of neglect and out of a, a fear of confrontation that could have, been, could have been saved if we would have simply, through a biblical process, gone to them and said, I want to repair this. And we followed the words of Jesus and said, you know what? I need to go to a brother. I need to, I need to make sure and not, not go to church again not get down on my knees again until I've done something, whether it's a prayer, whether it's a letter, whether it's something, to seek to repair these relationships that I know that are broken in my life. That was what Jesus said, not me. He says, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go home and seek to repair this relationship before you come back. Those are harsh words. And while I would say I'm not really sure what, what, what all of that implications are for us, I do get from that that Jesus was serious about us bringing holy, compassionate, gracious confrontation into our lives. Amen. He wants us to seek to redeem other people that have left. In fact, along those same lines, this is what the Bible says. In James chapter 5, verse 16, it says, Therefore confess your sins one to another, and pray for one another that you might be healed, because the prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. When we engage with one another, when we talk to one another, when we become vulnerable with one another, it has a tangible and direct effect on our relationship to prayer and to the church. The Bible says confess your sins to one another because it makes, it has an effect on your prayer life. It has an effect on your spirituality. And it says something to the greater body of, of, the, of the church, the greater humanity on this earth that look at us and see how we act. How many of you have seen this verse here in John chapter 13? John chapter 13, this is what the Bible says. Jesus speaking about his disciples says this, by this will all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. It doesn't say that they're going to know us by what day of the week we worship on. It doesn't say they'll know us by what we eat. It doesn't say they're going to know us about what our theology is. It says that they're going to know uh, that we are disciples of Jesus Christ based on how we treat one another. And when we as individuals lead life and go throughout time leaving a broken strewn stream of carnage behind us of broken relationships, that says something about our view of God. When we go through life, one broken relationship after another, one painful, broken friendship after another, that says something about where we're at with God. By this will all men know that you are my disciples, that you have love for one another. Would that we would have that love in our lives and we'd say, God, you've been calling me to repair a relationship. All of us went ding and we think in our heads immediately, I can think of a couple relationships right now, myself included, that need a little attention. Some relationships that need to be repaired. Maybe I wasn't the one that messed up. Maybe I wasn't the one that caused it, but like the Bible says, if you're aware of a problem, you need to take the responsibility to try and fix it. A couple of years ago in another land, another faraway place, there was a young lady in a similar situation in this story that was attending my church and she began to espouse that the way that we had always understood salvation was wrong. And she began to say that, you know what, we have to do these other things to be saved. And you know what, the way that we understand salvation by grace, that's a problem and that's not really the way that, 
we really should understand it. And slowly she began to come up with all this whole new theology and she was being influenced by these other people. And it came to the place that she was coming to our church and handing out pamphlets in the lobby talking about how what the Adventist church was doing was wrong and what the Adventist church was doing was Babylon. She began sharing this stuff throughout my church. Her and a couple of other people. And what I wanted to do was put my hands over my face and say, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. But they began to hand out pamphlets to new believers and to new converts and people that didn't have any sort of biblical foundation. They began to read this stuff and say, what? And so I felt like I had to confront this, this lady. And so I remember sitting in my office talking to my senior pastor as he said that he had to go out of town and so if I'd please take care of this confrontation for him. <laughs> and I remember driving to her house and sitting on her porch and saying, Sister, I love you. We care for you at our church. And we did. She was an important part of our church. And I said, but Sister, this is a problem because of this, this, and this. And she said, no, Pastor, you're wrong. You, you, you bought the lie, too. And then she said, you're wrong. And so I said, I said, no, sister, you're wrong because of this, 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 and this. And it began a conversation where I began to share from Scripture how we're saved and how God comes into our heart. And over the process of time, as we continued to have these kind of conversations, we came to the place where she ended up standing in front of the church and saying, you know what? This last year, I've said and done some things that I now am convicted were wrong. And I'm sorry. And I've found a new love for Jesus Christ. And I'm so incredibly grateful for His grace. And I just want to say I'm sorry. And I want to say thank you for having been called out. And I stood there and I just thought, praise God. Praise God. Would we not all be healthier, more balanced, and better, and better for the, the experience of coming to each other and saying, My friend, my sister, I'm worried for you. I'm worried for me. And I want this relationship to work. I need to confront you. I need to repair what has been broken between the two of us. And so Paul finishes his story. Peter's brought back in. Everything is better. The church of Galatia is blessed. The, the body of Christ grows, thousands are added to the church day by day, and it never would have happened if Paul had not taken the courage to seek to repair a relationship. What relationships do you need to repair this week? What relationships do you need to write names down on the back of the sheet this week during your prayer time and say, you know what? I need to engage with a holy confrontation. I need to fix something that's gotten broken. God will be involved with that process. God wants to see relationships repaired. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, you want us to repair relationships. You want us to seek and to find and to redeem those friendships that have gone by the wayside. Give us the strength. Give us the courage. We love you in your name.